ahead and, and get started here. So um, today we'll have a talk by, by Tyler Neely. He's over at the University of Queensland um, where he holds a, an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship um, working on BCs, experimental BCs and, and superfluid turbulence. And so Tyler and I actually met back in a long time ago when we were both PhD students in Brian Anderson's lab in Arizona. And so I guess both of us have kept some interest in the, in the superfluids as things have gone on. So I'll turn that over to Tyler and thank you. All right, thanks Kaylee. And thanks uh, very much for the invitation to talk today. So um, yeah, I'm happy today to, to be presenting some of the work from the lab here, the BEC lab here at the University of Queensland um, on uh, 2D vortex dynamics and Bose gases. Um, and okay, there we go. So I'll just start with a quick outline of what I'll be talking about. Um, just uh, reminding people, um, sorry if this is repeating lots of things that everybody already know about point vortices and particular on cycles treatment of point vortices um, and uh, the prediction of these negative temperature states for point vortices uh, forming in the clusters. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about the experiment here. Um, and how we use uh, optical traps to confine and stir BCs and uh, put vortices into them. Um, and then I'll get into the, the heart of the subject of today's talk, uh, which is exploring the gas phase of chiral vortex matter. Um, thinking about this phase as kind of a complement to the possible other configurations of vortices uh, um, in, a, in a superfluid. Um, and the approach that we've taken as a big collaborative team uh, uh, to this problem. Um, in particular, in the experiment, um, we've been looking at uh, the equilibrium states of these vortices, and I'll talk about that. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, revision of um, vortices and superfluids. Um, we're working with um, bosons and condensates, which means that um, uh, we have a very large condensate fraction, and you can attach a, a macroscopic wave function to the BEC, um, where in this case, the norm squared of the wave function is the density. So uh, here's a picture of a harmonically trapped simulation of a condensate of a boson and condensate, uh, where the density is given by uh, norm squared of the wave function. Um, uh, it's a complex value, so there's also this spatially varying phase associated with that. And um, if you look at the continuity equation uh, for wave function uh, that you normally see. In the typical treatment in quantum mechanics here, because of this density, it actually turns out that this um, uh, talks about the flow of the, the density. So in other words, currents related with the velocities given by the gradients of this phase. And so uh, the novel aspect here that leads to the um, uh, quantization of vortices in these systems is that uh, the wave function needs to be single valued, which implies that if I have a point uh, where there's Calculation about in the condensate, uh, then that phase needs to change by a, a factor of two pi. Um, one of the nice things about BECs is that I suppose relative to the vortex core size, um, they're a bit smaller than the superfluid helium systems, uh, but the uh, vortex cores are on the uh, sort of half micron scale or so, which means that they um, are optically resolvable with high resolution imaging systems. And so here's an image from our experiment just demonstrating that where we've put a bunch of vortices into a condensate and done a very short time of flight to make the vortices a little bit bigger. And you can see them as these density dips um, inside, the dense, inside the condensate there. Um, so the interest with this connection to uh, Onsiker's theory is um, uh, if you look at the, uh, the vorticity, uh, which is the curl of that velocity field, um, because the uh, because the, um, the velocity field is a gradient of, of some function, uh, the curl of a gradient is zero. That means that the, the vorticity has to be concentrated inside this small vortex core. And so uh, this situation is very similar to uh, an object, a uh, mathematical object called a point vortex. And so uh, the idea uh, for, for our experimental system here is to uh, consider how well the 2D boson and condensate approximates an isolated gas at point vortices and whether or not we can experimentally uh, uh, investigate the dynamics of that gas at point vortices. Um, so um, 
point vortex model. Um, there's nothing really worth highlighting too much here. I think everybody's familiar with um, uh, the quantization of the vortex. Um, uh, the vorticity, you just add up all the vortices inside your, inside your gas at different locations. Um, the velocity field has this form where it decreases as one on R, uh, which is the case for rotational vortices in general and in, uh, in viscid fluids. Um, but the interesting thing about uh, this uh, vortex guess is actually when you have more than one vortex in the system, and uh, this is for an unbounded system, but the energy between those two vortices only depends on the positions of the vortices. And so um, this is a bit different than, you know, say a gas of particles where, you know, those particles can in principle have any value of kinetic energy. Um, uh, here, the, the energy is completely dependent on the positions of the vortices inside the system. Um, this is just the vortex energy, of course. Uh, so this was the um, insight that Lars Ongsager had, um, um, you know, more than 70 years ago um, in thinking about point vortices <clears throat> and realizing that there's perhaps a, an explanation in the dynamics of point vortices to explain uh, the, the appearance of, of uh, large coherent vortices in, in effectively two-dimensional fluids. And so, you know, the archetypical example that everybody likes to talk about is, um, is the great red spot on Jupiter, which, you know, has all this energy being generated all the time, but then it ends up in this big coherent vortex. And so he wondered if he could abstractly think about this from the perspective of point vortices and uh, uh, describe the persistence of these large vortices um, from, that, from that perspective. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about the point vortices is again, since the energy depends on only the positions, uh, the phase space available um, is bounded by the area of the container. So if I have a uh, little in here is the, the total number of vortices in my system. Uh, the total phase space, uh, the integral of the phase space is just going to be some um, some uh, uh, exp exponentiation of the area. Um, so uh, thinking about that system a bit a bit more, uh, if you define a phase volume, which is just saying I'm going to integrate over that phase space for configurations of vortices below some particular energy. Um, and if I look at that function, um, that, that integrated function as a function of energy, I get this sort of sigmoidal shape because it has to maximize that um, at this fixed value because of the bounded system. And so um, if I consider that being the integral of some density of states, uh, you can then take the, uh, you can then plot that out and you see that it has this uh, maximum and then it decreases as the energy increases. Um, and so uh, this is this concept of negative temperatures that comes out of Onsager's model in that entropy being the log of the density of states has a negative slope above some critical value of the energy. And there's two extremes here. Um, one of those is that at the lowest energy configuration, you have opposite vortices coinciding. Um, and then the highest, highest energy configuration um, is actually like vortices coinciding. And so this, this is the sense that the high energy states of this 2D point vortex uh, gas um, uh, correspond to uh, clusters of like sine vortices. And so the idea is if you put enough energy into the system, if energy is being continually pumped in, then the, what you'll see in the end is that you have uh, coherent large scale vortices in your system. Um, of course, you know, so Onsager's model was extremely idealized um, because, you know, point vortices are not necessarily a great approximation for the classical fluids he was thinking of. Um, but it's, uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, quite applicable to, to quantum fluids, it turns out. Um, and so the you know, superfluid systems or quantum fluid systems that we have accessible are generally um, uh, things like superfluid helium or, uh, or uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. And in particular, we're interested in the atomic ones in our, in our uh, experimental setup here in Queensland. And again, the, the advantage between these two, I suppose, is that uh, there's, you know, there has been quite a bit of recent work on, on films of effective 2D films of superfluid helium, um, but the, uh, uh, the BC setup has a little bit more control and then you can actually uh, image the vortices directly. 
Um, and, and this is all done through optical trapping and control of the 2D superfluids, um, which we found to be quite a powerful system for studying 2D vortex dynamics. Um, just pausing to see if there's any questions coming up. I guess it's just questions at the end, Kaylee. Really, yes, but if someone has a question, okay. you can pop a hand up. Happy for people to interrupt if, if, that's, if, uh, if, if they like to. Um, so so it, given, given that we're um, interested in this atomic boson site condensate system, I thought I'd just briefly talk a little bit what we actually got down in the basement uh, here below me. Um, so this is, you know, I guess more or less the standard Bose-Einstein condensate setup, which I for uh, rubidium A7, which I haven't shown here. Um, but the sort of the well at, at the time novel aspects of our system, I suppose, um, uh, have to do with the uh, optical trapping that we're using uh, to configure and manipulate the condensate. And so we use a far off resonant optical dipole trap uh, that consists of two beams. One of those is a a Gaussian beam, which has been uh, shaped into a, a light sheet. So that's something that's very tightly focused vertically and then has a um, extent, you know, a much larger extent in the horizontal plane. Uh, on top of that, we use a digital micromere device, uh, which is a, a spatial light modulator that's in most overhead projectors anymore. Um, this allows you to make a binary pattern and then you just send this through a microscope objective and you get a, uh, a, a pattern projected uh, to where the atoms are sitting. And, be, and this, this allows you then to use that pattern of light to uh, shape and, and manipulate the, the uh, EEC. Um, and this was some time ago that we implemented this. And I think this is this has actually become a, a relatively popular um, setup for, uh, for a few BEC experiments uh, anymore. Um, and then, you know, so, so we're uh, looking at 2D vortex dynamics and that's given by this light sheet. Um, which in the end gives us about a 20 to one sort of aspect ratio for our system. So uh, sort of like a, you know, somewhat close to like a coin uh, if you were to look at it and John. All the images I'll show here are actually looking down from the top. Um, so that's the longer directions uh, using this uh, microscope objective. Uh, so there's really a lot of control with this um, and, you know, we've, uh, first thing you kind of do once you have this control is just trying to have some fun with it. Um, so here's our Bose and Einstein and a Bose Einstein condensate or our BEC squared um, by shaping this light pattern and then loading a condensate into that. Um, uh, then the, the atoms follow the, the light pattern. Um, and, you know, my profile picture on Zoom is, you know, we've taken three BECs, one for each red, blue, and green channel, and then combine them in a false color image. Um, and then we actually managed to get in Daily Mail, which is kind of fun, uh, with a picture of, <laughs> of the Mona Lisa. So uh, that was a couple of years ago now. Um, so how do we use this for, for actually doing our vortex research? Um, so here's an example of that. Uh, here we have um, the uh, pattern uh, projected, which gives us uh, this uh, egg-shaped or, or ellipsoid, uh, ellipse-shaped condensate. Um, all the mirrors, you know, the, the light that we use is actually repels the atoms. So in this case, the light is high outside where there's no atoms. And so that means by turning on the mirrors sequentially playing a movie, we can also introduce stirring barriers into the condensate. And so these barriers then propagate across and doing so at sufficient velocity, uh, you end up with clusters of vortices being shed in the wake of those, uh, of those stirring barriers. Um, because you have broad control over the shape of the barriers, uh, in this particular example, we also looked at a grid of barriers going across the condensate. Um, the end result is a different configuration of vortices. And so, um, uh, so this was this was our interest in first looking for the, the high energy states um, predicted by Onsager in the system, um, where you know if we have these paddles going across, it turns out that they make these very nice tight clusters of vortices that are very well separated from each other. Uh, if you look at the you know the energy of these um, from the point vortex perspective, it's very high, and it's sitting out here um, in this area of phase space where you have these these clusters of vortices at high energy and negative temperature. 
So this is that same, you know, same plot that I had earlier, but now showing you what the configurations of vortices look like. Um, so remember that low energy configuration for the neutral system was you have opposite signs hanging out together. Uh, as you increase the energy, you eventually get this cusp in the entropy uh, where, um, where the inverse temperature goes to zero. So this is the infinite temperature case for the, uh, for the gas of vortices, uh, where they're maximally sort of uncorrelated. Um, as the energy continues to increase, eventually there's a phase transition where they start uh, forming these clusters. And then as energy increases even further, the clusters become tighter and tighter. And then way down here at some very high energy uh, in the point vortex model, all the vortices collapse onto points. Um, that's actually an area where this, it's not physical uh, for, for the, the Bose-Einstein condensate system. Uh, because these cores, you know, are not actually points in the end, they have some, some small but, um, but finite size to them. Um, so, uh, so we did this experiment a few years ago and, um, and it demonstrated that you really have a lot of control over injecting vortices um, and also doing so with a particular configuration and energy uh, to some degree. Um, but this, this neutral system where you have equal numbers of, of uh, uh, vortices and anti-vortices or, or plus and minus vortices, tend to call them uh, plus and minus charges, as you can see here. Um, there's a lot of other possible configurations that are not neutral, in other words, that they're unbalanced. And another thing <clears throat> in this experiment is really cool to see these states predicted after the 70 years uh, or so, but uh, but there's some lingering questions about equilibrium and that, you know, this was our stirring scheme. We inject something that's very close to equilibrium and then it stayed put um, in that equilibrium state. But what about if you start from a very far from equilibrium condition? Um, what you really like to see is that the system then dynamically finds uh, the equilibrium condition uh, uh, predicted by the theory. Um, so that takes me on to uh, uh, the, I guess the opposite extreme of, of the neutral system where you have equal numbers of plus and minus vortices, but uh, where you actually have only a single sign of vortices. And so this is what's known as a chiral vortex matter. And um, in, in BC literature and history, um, going back, uh, you know, nearly 20 years now, um, the solid phase of this matter, the Brickisoft lattice, um, is quite familiar to everybody who's seen pictures of vortices in a, in a bose, uh, atomic Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, from the point vortex perspective, um, the system is somewhat different in that the net angular momentum is now non-zero. And so now there's actually two conserved quantities, which are the energy and the angular momentum. And so again, you have the same form of the interaction energy. Um, in this case, uh, this is now accounting for the boundary through the introduction of this image vortex term, which makes make sure that the flow uh, is tangential to the boundary of the condensate and not going through it. Um, but now there's this uh, this angular momentum, um, which is uh, you know uh, more or less proportional to uh, the number of vortices uh, in the system, um, and then uh, as they distribute themselves out towards the edges. Uh, you could see for a single vortex that this, uh, this would go to zero, um, uh, basically, right? So, um, but in the point vortex literature, um, uh, usually people forget about these constant terms or, or you know, they're, they're terms that come, come into uh, to the equation because of our finite system. And so uh, just for the sake of defining uh, this this uh, parameter M that I'll use uh, in, or is plotted in, in the plots I'll show in a moment, um, that's just forgetting about this constant term out front. And so the angular momentum is actually zero, this point which is the angular momentum is actually zero when the vortex is in the center and it's maximized when the vortex is on the edge. Um, so if that's a solid phase of, of vortex matter, um, there should be liquid phases. Um, so this would be a slightly higher energy than that ground state lattice of the, the chiral vortex system. And um, um, this is actually a neutral system, but shows this kind of fluid-like behavior in this theory paper uh, where they see, they see the development of a shear layer. And actually there's some, um, some work from Bagley and Parker that also sees the same thing numerically, uh, which I probably should have included here. Um, uh, there's also sort of things like uh, vortex diffusion, 
uh, which we looked at in this paper from last year. Um, and these, these phases are, are definitely very interesting, um, especially the solid phase, given its connection with solid state uh, and its matter systems through the quantum Hall effect um, and, and even the fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, and liquid phases are interesting in other systems as well. Um, but what we're interested in here is the dilute high energy configurations, which are uh, the, the gas of, of uh, chiral vortices. Um, and so again, this is, this is now uh, this entropy versus energy curve. Again, um, this is now for the single sign system. And actually it doesn't really look that different from the neutral system. Um, so the broad features are there. Um, there's some infinite temperature state, uh, and then there's this whole range of negative temperature states. Um, the, uh, uh, the lattice, so the, the Brikasov lattice is going to be some very low energy uh, uh, configuration of the vortices. And then an interesting thing, um, well, sorry, I should also say that uh, in the previous case, we only had one curve. Uh, um, in this case, there's this uh, uh, possibility of different angular momentum for the system. Um, so you'll get a bunch of different curves. And really this is a phase space, which I'll show a, an image of in a second, a two-dimensional phase space. Um, uh, but an interesting happens for these negative temperature uh, states of the vortices in the chiral system in that uh, they're actually associated with these um, off-axis clusters. Um, and so as you increase the energy uh, rather than having a um, um, you know, very, say, tightly concentrated vortex at the center, it's actually forced to go off center. And then, uh, then another interesting thing that has come out of um, the work that uh, Hader uh, Salman's done in collaboration with us on this project is that you can actually have these other, um, um, other solutions which, uh, which have smaller entropies for a given energy, but I'll get into, the, I'll come back to that later. Um, and uh, so far, uh, these, these high energy dilute states of vortex matter have eluded experimental observation as they're very sensitive to the energy loss. But one of the key things we showed in our, our previous work was that um, you know, when we injected these clusters in the neutral system, they stick around in the system for a very long time um, relative to the vortex dynamics time. So this is you know, uh, uh, nearly 10 seconds is about the measurement we made. Um, and so the energy loss from the vortices is small here. Um, so this, uh, this idea that these uh, high energy phases in the chiral system are off axis um, seems maybe slightly weird, at least it did to me originally in that, um, I guess you normally expect an equilibrium state to share the symmetry of, of the system that it's in. You know, this is uh, just a, a disc, so it's uh, symmetric about the middle, um, but if you remember, the energy has to do with the separation of the vortices and the angular momentum now can be non-zero. Um, you could imagine that uh, and the angular momentum again is just the, the, the mean, uh, essentially the mean uh, position of the vortices. Uh, you, you could imagine that if for a sufficiently high energy, you need to cluster the vortices together uh, to get that energy. Uh, but uh, to have a non-zero value of angular momentum, um, they actually need to be off axis. And so uh, if you vary um, energy, in, the energy and angular momentum in modeling this point vortex system, um, this is the results that um, uh, we built substantially on in our, our, our experimental, uh, our, our striving to, to realize this experimentally is following this paper uh, from Smith and O'Neill from 1990. And you, you can see there's this phase diagram of um, uh, energy versus angular momentum and different possible configurations for the vortices. And so interestingly, most of this space here is these non-axisymmetric clusters. You know, and, and the Abrikasov lattice is going to be sitting, you know, somewhere, somewhere essentially just a point on this line. Um, so how do you actually predict these uh, uh, equilibria? Um, the idea is to use a large uh, N approach or a mean field approach. And so even though we have a discrete number of vortices, I should point out again that this is uh, work that's been done by uh, Hader Selman uh, in modeling our system. Uh, so we have, uh, we can just forget that we have, you know, 12 to 14 vortices in our, in our experimental system, 
uh, consider a continuous vortex distribution and entropy associated with that. Um, it turns out that the maximum entropy states of the microcanonical micro ensemble are determined by uh, uh, these equations here um, that depend on this inverse temperature, um, which is uh, you know the parameter we were looking at before in the neutral system. Uh, but there's also this uh, omega, this beta omega term, uh, which is the equivalent of an inverse temperature for the angular momentum. Uh, it doesn't have a name, uh, but you can think. But the units of omega are, are rotation. Um, and so, uh, uh, if you look at Smith and O'Neill's paper, um, it turns out the vortex density that satisfies the requirements um, is given by the Poisson-Boltzmann equation for the stream function which is the potential that you can get the, uh, the streamlines for the fluid flow from. Um, and this actually has a, a relatively straightforward solution um, in terms of this uh, inverse temperature and this omega. And these are just rescaled versions of that um, uh, because that's what's shown in, in the results. Um, so, so you can take this mean field density and we'll see in a second with the experimental results, uh, we're actually using uh, the predicted mean field density and using that to fit to the experimental data and extract what beta and omega are from the theory. Uh, but here's some example solutions, which you know look like the schematic that I showed earlier. Um, these are for particular values of, of, um, of beta, and sorry, I didn't write what omega are for these two, which I should have. Um, uh, but you know these are, for example, one of the axisymmetric solutions for a particular angular, angular momentum and energy, and then for a different angular momentum and energy, uh, it predicts an off-axis uh, equilibrium solution. Um, and uh, there's, in particular, a, a, a few sort of notable um, inflection points or, or sort of a, um, uh, exact solutions to this, this equation. Um, at particular values of beta and omega. And so we're just listing the, them here. Um, so this, uh, this on-axis cluster uh, actually has the velocity field of a ranking vortex um, um, that has, you know, uh, strictly as, as beta goes to, uh, as temperature goes to zero, um, beta goes to infinity, particular value of omega. So you're increasing the energy um, at, at the uh, infinite temperature point um, omega emerges, but the beta omega, uh, uh, the, the a product of those remains finite, and, it, and you end up with a, a nice form of the um, vortex density, which looks like a Gaussian um, as you continue to increase the energy further. Um, the, you get this uh, sort of almost Lorentzian shape, um, which is given by a solution of the Riccati equation. And then uh, above a critical value of omega equals one. Uh, omega hat equals one uh, is where the off-axis uh, equilibria emerge. And then finally, at the highest energy, you have this supercondensate state. And so, um, so I'll just go back to the other. So those, those particular interesting values are, are labeled on this plot. Um, that was the ranking vortex, the Gaussian, the Riccati, um, the transition to off-axis at omega, equals, omega hat equals one. And then supercondensate is way down here at some very high energy. Okay, so hopefully we're up to speed on um, the possible configurations of this gas. So now they now that now our aim was actually to just try and observe each of these states experimentally, and in particular also see them emerging from um, non-equilibrium initial conditions. Um, and and these non-equilibrium initial conditions are are actually something that it turns out the mean field also predicts. Um, so you can add things like these uh, an, another branch. Of solutions, which uh, Hader has found, uh, where you have um, something like these two clusters. Um, in equilibrium, this should be a single off axis cluster rather than two clusters. And uh, nicely, I suppose, it, it also comes from looking at the entropy for that given energy. Uh, the entropy of this configuration is a lot lower than, than having single off axis clusters. So you'd expect that uh, the dynamics would want to maximize entropy, and you'll go from this configuration up to a, a single off axis cluster. Um, right. 
So that's the, exp the experimental aim in the sense of, of looking at the non-equilibrium is to initialize things like this and then see that they equilibrate to single clusters or the, or the various other states. Oops. Um, so how do we actually implement this in the experiment? Um, so these are uh, not experimental images, but they're uh, uh, gross PTFC equation simulations of the stirring process. And this is very similar to what we what I showed earlier in our, our previous work on the neutral system, uh, where we have a disk shaped uh, condensate. Uh, we introduce a barrier by turning on DMD mirrors. This sweeps across, and then uh, a cluster of vortices is created in the wake of that barrier. And then once the barrier leaves the system, then the vortices are free to uh, roam around the condensate and hopefully find uh, the equilibrium configuration. Um, so our first uh, stirring scheme. Um, and there's, uh, there's five stirring schemes, so hopefully I won't lose anybody. Um, but the first stirring scheme um, was just to, uh, kind of like the, the other experiment where we had two clusters um, uh, about the center of the condensate. Now we, we're seeking to make one cluster, so this is gonna be very close to a point vortex equilibrium state of one of these off-axis clusters. Here's an image of the actual uh, vortices in the experiment. Um, the, the next scheme would be to try and introduce one of these uh, uh, mean field solutions, but the lower entropy one. So this is now uh, two clusters. Um, and so this should, uh, should th that's done by just having two barriers which sweep in opposite directions. Uh, this should then end up as a, um, a single cluster in equilibrium. And you can see the two clusters of vortices that were generated in the experiment. Uh, sorry, this third panel here is the phase. It's just, just demonstrating that um, each one of these vortices has the same uh, phase winding, meaning they're the same sign. Uh, a trickier one experimentally, it turned out, was actually to create uh, something close to the, the ranking vortex state or those on axis clusters. Um, uh, TMD provides a lot of flexibility with what you can do with the condensate. And I realized that my arrows are not correct on this. Sorry about that. Um, uh, but anyway, so, so we start with this ring-shaped condensate. We have a barrier that we introduce into it. That barrier rotates around uh, over, over um, you know, accelerates and rotates around. Um, that pushes the fluid around, stirring it up. This is the same as what the NIST group of Gretchen Campbell has done for stirring up persistent currents. Uh, then it's removed towards the center. Uh, and then finally, this central barrier is removed, and that leaves a cluster of vortices. Uh, inside the inside the disk shaped condensate, um, and so that's what that looks like at the end of the stirring process in the, in the experiment. Um, this is a an interesting non equilibrium um, uh, initial condition, really, because uh, this isn't you know this is not something you would you'd be able to model by point vortices because it essentially starts as this giant vortex, uh, but it rack, rapidly breaks up because of the instability of giant vortices and and VCs into the individual vortices uh, that you can see here. Um, and this actually turns out then being close to one of these axisymmetric equilibrium cases. Uh, so one thing worth noting about the experimental images here is that uh, we're doing destructive images of the BEC. So we can't track the dynamics of individual trajectories. Um, instead, we take many shots of this of the experiment uh, hoping and you know, I guess being somewhat validated that the uh, that the initial conditions of the experiment are are repeatable, um, and then uh, gradually increment the hold time after doing this whole stirring sequence uh, to look at the um, the uh, uh, ensemble averages of the dynamics of the vortices um, over the course of zero to uh, about a little less than seven seconds in this experiment. Um, so here's some uh, here's some images of uh, just example images of the of the sort of con uh, distributions of vortices that we see for these three different uh, uh, stirring schemes. Uh, so the central cluster, um, the single cluster off-axis, and then the double cluster experiment. Um, uh, these little white circles are just the uh, we detect the vortices using a, a, an algorithm. Um, actually, from Simon Cornish's group, who's the one who pointed pointed that out in a paper, um, uh, and then uh, here are histograms showing um, all the vortex positions from around 40 runs of the experiment for each one of these times. 
Uh, and so uh, they, the interesting one to look at here, I suppose, is the double cluster experiment in that we start with these two well-defined clusters. Uh, and, and as the time uh, uh, progresses, um, after about three seconds, you can now see that the, they're significantly off axis and not centered about the, the middle of the condensate. Um, so it appears already from these uh, histograms of the vortex positions that, that we're seeing this equilibration into an off axis state. Oops. Um, so uh, if we really believe that uh, point vortices is the right model to apply here, um, uh, we ought to go and try and apply uh, and, and actually uh, directly take those experimental vortex positions and apply uh, uh, point vortex dynamics uh, to them. And so this is the work of, of Matt Reeves and Oliver Stockdale. Um, who are, uh, Oliver's now, uh, now, now left QQ, but Matt, Matt's still here and also working on many other vortex experiments with me. Um, and so here's an example of uh, taking those initial experimental configurations and then doing uh, point vortex modeling of them. Um, and so these are the three different experiments shown with these different symbols. So that was a central cluster, uh, the side one with these blue squares, uh, double cluster with the, um, the green diamonds and the various parameters that we might be interested in. So the number of vortices as a function of hold time, uh, the dipole moment, which is, uh, I think I missed that on one of the other plots, but that's um, essentially a measure of just, um, you know, how, how off axis is the, the just the cluster of vortices, uh, the energy uh, normalized by n squared and the angular momentum. And, um, and this point vortex model uh, has two extra parameters, which you might not near, normally get in it, which is that, uh, we, so our experiment is not, not totally isolated. It's not a completely pure Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, so there's dissipation uh, due to thermal friction uh, mainly, uh, which is this gamma term. Uh, but then he, he found as well that he needed some stochastic noise uh, to be able to capture uh, the dynamics of the experiment. And so we're still a little bit of a, a work in progress as to what exactly that stochastic noise is. Uh, it could be things like, um, you know, inhomogeneities in the optical potential or, or perhaps the trap shakes around slightly or we're not exactly sure. Um, and, and one thing worth pointing out just for completeness is that um, um, these two off axis cases, uh, this is a plot showing the basically the error in these fits uh, uh, versus uh, these parameters of, of damping on this axis and noise. And you can see that the two off axis cases uh, find their minimum parameters around the same value. Uh, but for some reason, the on axis case doesn't seem to require any of this noise. So that, that says something about maybe the spatial location of the inhomogeneity and the potential if that's the cause. Anyways, that's somewhat of a minor detail. Um, but one of the things that we get from these plots is that uh, if we look at everything after about, say, three and a half seconds, uh, these parameters don't actually change very much. So there's, you know, some, maybe some fast initial damping, some dynamics, um, note that the scales here don't go to zero. Um, but then after about three and a half seconds, um, these parameters are maybe changing by about five or 10%. Um, so if we just take all of those vortex histograms, uh, sorry, past 3.25 seconds, um, uh, just put them all together, um, into some big histogram and then actually use those mean fields, uh, that mean field theory uh, to directly fit the experimental data, um, uh, you get some remarkably good agreement. And so this is that case of that side sweep. Um, and you can see here the, uh, uh, the experimental points with the squares and, the, um, uh, and then the line, the field area is the, is the, uh, the mean field. Uh, this is integrating along the X direction and then this one is integrating along, uh, sorry, integrating along the y direction, integrating along the x direction. And so then the fitted values of the inverse temperature and omega come out of this. And so as I suppose you would expect, this corresponds to a, a negative temperature off axis cluster. Um, and so this is done for the other, uh, uh, the other sweeps that I, I described already. Um, so the center sweep and the double sweep. And in each case, you can see that there's a, a very nice agreement um, with the mean field solution, which is uh, perhaps somewhat surprising considering that we don't have infinite vortices. We only have 12 uh, or approximately 12 across the different experiments. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, so this one's very positive temperature, which makes sense. Um, and then uh, the double sweep uh, again is negative temperature, but it's, it's actually quite close to that, um, that transition point of omega equals one, and well, it's closer to it um, than this very off axis cluster. Okay, so what about, so those, um, those were sort of three of those possible ABCDE uh, equilibria that I described earlier. Um, so what about making some of the other ones? Um, this is some more, uh, more recent work on this project um, where um, uh, we've, we've uh, figured out sort of ways to approach making this Gaussian state and also the Riccati state. Um, and so this experimentally is a bit more challenging um, uh, given that we need a somewhat finer control over the initial energy and angular momentum, which basically means like the number of vortices and their positions. Um, but there was this uh, technique from uh, uh, Carlos Sampson's uh, thesis uh, back again in Brian Anderson's group, um, where actually you can take a, a barrier and spiral it in from the outside. And then this, um, uh, in the end, creates a bunch of pin vortices that follow this barrier into the condensate. And then again, by removing the, removing the barrier, uh, you then end up with um, the clusters of vortices freed into the, into the condensate. And so here's what that looks like in the experiment. Uh, and so uh, we were actually guided by point vortex simulations um, in terms of you know, picking initial cluster locations and numbers uh, to try and, um, try and find these other two states. So looked at the point vortex dynamics, thought we could get something that, that's close to these other two states and then use that to come up with an experimental protocol. Um, and so the other one is the Riccati uh, state, which is, uh, really essentially the same, but you can see that um, there's some slight differences here in the, in the final position of these clusters of vortices. <clears throat> um, I, I suppose actually, uh, since the Riccati occurs at slightly higher en energy, um, these two clusters are, are now starting closer to each other, which is high energy configuration. Um, uh, but again, these are still non-equilibrium initial conditions. Uh, so here's, um, uh, here's now the distributions um, based on previous results. Uh, we just picked a long enough hold time and then took a bunch of runs. Um, and so here's uh, the, the results of doing the experiment, trying injecting those clusters, seeking to see the Gaussian state. Um, and we get again a nice fit to the mean field theory, um, which is very close to that beta equals zero infinite temperature uh, regime. Um, and beta, beta omega is. Um, Beta omega is some, some sort of uh, this value of 7.5, which means omega is di diverging towards infinity, which is what you would expect uh, for the Gaussian. Um, and then uh, this uh, sort of near Riccati state um, is, is only subtly different from the Gaussian. And so we, we really took a lot of data here to try and uh, uh, make sure we had enough experimental data to distinguish the Riccati from the Gaussian. And it, uh, if, you, if you try and fit a Gaussian to this, it doesn't, doesn't work nearly as well um, and vice versa for this case. Um, and so you can see here again, a nice agreement with the mean field results. Um, uh, now, you know, now a negative temperature, even though it's this on axis case um, and, and this, uh, this corresponding value of omega hat. Okay, so this is my last slide, Kaylee. I think I'm hopefully going on time here uh, before the conclusion. Uh, but we can now plot out all these experimentally realized um, uh, states on the phase diagram. Uh, this one's a little bit different from uh, Smith and O'Neill's uh, phase diagram that we saw earlier. Maybe I should just go back to that. To, I should have put it in this slide. Yeah, there we go. So there's this huge region which is inconsistent, where E is inconsistent with M, so just subtracting off this line effectively. And in the experiment, uh, because of the the sort of energy and angular momentum we can access, we're looking at sort of a quadrant region of this phase diagram. Uh, but nonetheless, if you plot all these, uh, these mean field fitted, uh, so the mean field fits give us, uh, uh, you know, angular momentum and, and energy for these different configurations. And you can see where, where our different experiments ended up. Um, so uh, certainly realizing the ranking state uh, really close to the Gaussian state, uh, approaching that Riccati state, which is the, the line C here. Uh, D is the transition to off axis. Uh, 
and you can see our non-equilibrium double staircase um, ends up in that region. And then the single, um, the single uh, paddle or single cluster case where we had uh, a relatively high energy and high momentum cluster um, as well within that off-axis uh, space of the system. Uh, what about the supercondensate? Okay, well, that's not really something that's possible with uh, the physical BEC system um, uh, given the finite core size. Uh, so I'll just summarize there. Um, uh, so uh, this experiment is a, a pretty significant step beyond the previous work, um, really definitively showing that you can start in a non-equilibrium configuration and obtain uh, equilibrium configuration uh, through through the dynamics in the system, even in the presence of, of some damping. Um, uh, we've uh, um, demonstrated a substantial fraction of these uh, predicted chiral vortex equilibria, uh, including positive, near infinite, and negative temperatures. Um, we're not exactly sure about this, but uh, this quantitative agreement with this Poisson Boltzmann equation in the mean field, uh, it might be sort of one of the first times that, that somebody's really been able to just apply that directly to experimental data. Uh, maybe this is a good audience to ask about that. Um, some potential future directions. Uh, one thing that's missing here is the Brickasov lattice. So what about the low energy state in this system? Um, so we're, we're interested in, in pursuing that. Um, there's other things you might do in playing around with the DMD, like um, reducing the loss of vortices through the edge, uh, which is which was somewhat of a problem for the single cluster case. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, really pushing the, the possibilities of this technique of DMD stirring of clusters of vortices. Um, could, you, uh, could you come up with more complex initial conditions, which may give you some, some, different, uh, some different equilibrium state? Um, so I should thank the large uh, team of people involved in this work, um, especially Matt Reeves, who's really been driving this project um, uh, as a theorist uh, and giving us things to do, uh, you know, uh, in the lab and matches theory <laughs> in a way. Um, uh, Quan is a PhD student working on the project. Uh, Guillaume's postdoc and Oliver uh, was doing his master's here is now, now left. Uh, Hader, uh, collaborator in the UK um, and uh, the rest of our theory collaborators. And also, uh, of course, Selena, um, who's the, uh, uh, the BC lab originator and Matt Davis, who's the uh, theory lead here at UQ. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and happy to take, uh, take questions. Now. Thanks, Tyler. Um, that was a really interesting talk. If anyone has questions, um, you can raise your hand and alternatively just shout out. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start us off with one because I'm curious. So yeah. you mentioned that you mentioned having you sort of top out at about 12 vortices. Um, is there some limitation for the number of vortices that you can work with in, in this system? Um, yeah, well, so I guess so that, um, so I think we end up with a few more when we put in more than one cluster. Um, we can certainly get in a few more vortices there. Uh, but for the, the 12 vortex case, and I think I should just go back to the plots actually. Um, there we go. Um, so you can see that the, uh, um, uh, you know, if we have a single cluster of vortices and the number, the total number of vortices is a bit more limited. Um, and for example, with the center cluster, we're, we're limited here by, by the, the aspect that there is actually some roughness in the potential. So um, in the Cairo system, remember, something I should have pointed out earlier, right, is these equilibria are in a rotating frame of the vortices. So the lattice is actually rotating. If you're sitting there looking at the lab, um, it's, it's, a crystal, it's, a, it's a fixed crystal in the rotating frame of that vortex lattice. Um, so, you know, when you put in a lot of vortices here, you're actually getting a lot of rotation of the superfluid. And in our case, uh, for our 100 micron diameter disk, uh, we are finding that above about 25 vortices pinned in the center of the condensate. Uh, you start getting shedding of vortices at the wall. So it's just saying you're exceeding the superfluid critical velocity uh, uh, because of roughness, I suppose, in the potential. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, Davide, you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tyler. It's really interesting talk and then 
the experiments are just just amazing i mean really nice uh, and nice. the control that you have so um i i haven't really understood i mean how you can make a clear distinct uh, distinction between the type of vortices uh that that you describe like the Rankin and the, the gaussian and the ricati and so am i right in, in in thinking that basically i mean that shape is given by the let's say average vortex distribution in your system did i get it right yeah that's right so it says average um so, so how can you distinguish? I mean, among among them in a, in a clear in a clear ways. For example, I mean, when 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 does the Rankine ends and and the Gaussian starts to take place? Because if if you're doing some kind of average, you you will never really see something super clear like the Rankine or the Gaussian. Uh, well, well, so it's so it's um, uh, I guess I guess what what we're looking for is the. Um, uh, sort of the ensemble average distribution of vortices given a fixed initial condition. So every time we put in the same configuration, so we, you know, we ran for the, uh, for these experiments, you know, for the Riccati, for example, we ran the, we ran the experiment 300 and some 310 times or something. Um, uh, did the exact same thing every time we always start with the two clusters, which are very similar in vortex number and position, thus energy and angular momentum. And then looking at the, the ensemble average distribution of that after a certain amount of hold time, um, that's what this, this histogram here is. Um, and then, um, and then, uh, then taking that histogram and fitting the mean field to it and seeing that the mean field um, gives parameters that are, that are close, to, close to these Gaussian or Riccati states. So in an individual shot of the experiment, it, it doesn't look like anything special, right? Yeah. Um, it's really just in the ensemble average. But is, is it right that you could also, you know, find something in between? I mean, between a Riccati and a Gaussian, I mean, that would... Oh, yeah, sorry. So, um, so yeah, so, I mean, you, it's, you would, it's um, like a continuous a spectrum of... Yeah, of... yeah, it's a continuous spectrum. So, okay, okay. Um, so we are, we are being kind of deliberate in like, you know, uh, uh, these particular solutions, you know, we, we're sort of interested in them because they've got these, these sort of uh, analytic solutions um, uh, which sure, is in, sure. that, in this thing, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if it's worth going back to the slide, but, um, and so, uh, so, you know, we were, we were sort of specifically targeting those, um, uh, in, in particular for this Gaussian and Riccati state, right? We we're really targeting whether or not we can see these in the experiment, mm -hmm. um, and then using point vortices to kind of, you know, uh, explore the initial conditions for some non-equilibrium configuration that yeah. that looks like it'll give us something like that, and then we then we went and did the experiment using those conditions. Okay, thank and you. It turns out that that is pretty close to that. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I have yeah, another sure. question, but I will wait, maybe later. Okay, thank you. All right, Tom, I think you're up. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tyler. That was a really good talk. Um, so. I have a short question and a slightly longer question. Maybe I'll be rude and try and both then. Um, so the short question is how many sort of fitting parameters are there for the for fitting to the Poisson Boltzmann? Um, oh, is that a question I even know the answer to? I think I think it's just beta and omega, but it okay. be... yeah. it's not many, essentially. Yeah, no, there's not many. Yeah, okay. Um, my slightly longer question was, so you had this nice phase diagram at the end of where your experiments kind of are. Yeah, yeah. this one. Yeah, thanks. Um, is there potential that you can get closer to the line with the stars on? And if you, so one thing that's been looked at that's sort of interesting is how does the dipole moment vary as you cross this transition to oh, half-axis right. states, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wonder sort of, what level of control you have. And is it possible to do something like start a little bit off axis and then let the damping take you back on axis? Is that something you've thought about? Um, I think, well, you know, we did, we did sort of think about that, I guess. Um, I mean, one, one thing is actually, so this transition is of course complicated by the, this is something that is actually complicated by the, um, uh, the, fix, the, the low number of vortices and not being the mean field. Um, and so it, it becomes a bit more of a gradual growth in the dipole moment um, than you get in the, you know, in the n equals infinity case. Um, 
it's not something that we've, yeah, I guess we haven't. Okay, I, I see yeah, that's something it I haven't like thought of. Close so. to it. it was, it was, it was pretty challenging. You know, we thought we were going to be a little closer to the, this line C, to be honest. Um, but, um, but this is what the mean field fitting ends up giving us. Um, so I, I think that the parameter spacing here is, is, you know, perhaps still an experimental challenge to get into. Um, possibly, you know, if we, uh, you know, yeah. So something that was, you know, just marginally off axis and then gradually transitioned across um, would be pretty interesting to do. Uh, but but it mainly, you know, um, if you look at those plots of, sorry, I'm trying to skip back if I can. Does that work? Oop. Okay, sorry, this one. Um, so the annual momentum is almost constant, you know, um, where these other parameters are changing. Um, and so, uh, so really, you're so really the damping is kind of more affecting the energy. Um, and so, uh, I guess it's kind of because the damping causes the vortices to go apart. So then, you know, some of them go in and some of them come come out, right? And so maybe the angular momentum is kind of more conserved in that this point vortex angular momentum, anyways. Um, uh, and so, um, so uh, damping is always going to take you kind of in vertical lines here. Right, right. And so I think I think it's kind of, you know, having a very large energy where the point vortices are still applicable. And then, you know, managing to make it into this little this little section of the, the sliver here. I think that's probably possible experimentally, but um, but an open challenge um, from where we got with the results for this experiment. Great. Thanks very much. Sure. All right, I think, I mean, if people are, want to stay on with a few more questions, that's fine. I think we're at about at the end of the, of the hour. So I'll just real quick say um, that next, uh, the next seminar will be in two weeks time. And I believe it's actually me talking this time about some of the recent experiments that I did um, working with the cesium atterbium experiment in Durham. Um, so, but in the meantime, I think Davidi, you maybe had one more question there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kali. So, so my question is, what about the role of sound that that you, of course, have in 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 the experiment? So, so I mean, energy can be dissipated, or it can it can even well, sound can even interact a bit with vortices and maybe give a bit of energy to to, to vortices. So, so are you yeah. able to 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 quanti well to to quantify a bit the. Uh, uh, the, the time scale of, of such maybe you know dissipative process, not 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 really dissipative, but energy yeah, conversion so process. Uh, so so we didn't we didn't look at that. Um, so so the, I guess looking at this is essentially excuse me looking at the numerical simulations, and um, we didn't look at that extensively here, uh, but it was something we looked at in the previous work on the neutral system. Um, and you certainly generate some amount of sound. Um, some of the stirring schemes are, are more violent than others. Um, uh, these ones where the sort of barrier comes in from the edge, like shown here, right? That's that seems to be more gentle in terms of making sound. Um, the simulations of these these you can see that there's quite a bit of sound generated here. Um, that might have something to do with um, um, with with say the the. Uh, the equilibration dynamics, the time scale in which that happens. Um, but uh, if you look at these these simulations where there's damping, uh, which is roughly matching the experimental parameters, um, the sound tends to damp away relatively quickly, uh, and then the vortices, um, the vortices, you know, are, are now essentially all you know. Most of the energy is, is sorry, which is most of the energy originally starts in the incompressible uh, excitations, which are the vortices rather than the compressible ones. And then that amount of compressible energy just decreases with time, and um, and we we essentially thought that um, based on the numerical simulations of the other the, the neutral system experiment um, that uh, that's the the damping or the interactions with vortices and sound is actually quite small, um, and that actually it's the the thermal friction uh, with the thermal component. We we showed that if you increase the thermal the thermal fraction then the damping rate increases, um, regardless of, of you know leaving leaving the um, the stirring scheme the same. Okay, thank you, thank you. 
All right, and then I, I just one one last cheeky question, which is yes. how confident are you that all of the vortices have the sign that you that they're supposed to have based on these on um, your various stirring techniques? Um I guess, you know, I mean it's yeah, so we're not we're not directly detecting the vortex sign. Um uh, so I guess this was the reason for doing the numerical simulations was to, you know, have some maybe stronger in, in indication that the vortices are the same sign, but but also, um, uh, you know, for these sort of long equilibration times, um, and these these you know kind of it's sort of like a few I guess uh, circumstantial sort of uh, points of evidence, right? That that indicate that they, they should all be the same sign, like that you're saying, you know, uh, in this case, right, you know, this tight cluster of vortices, um, you know, if, if there was a, a, an opposite sign vortex in there, it will annihilate with one of them, most likely. Um, uh, seeing those, those matches with the chiral mean field was another indication that uh, the vortices should be very much majority the same sign. I guess because we didn't do the uh, the measurements in the experiment of detecting the vortex sign, there's some possibility that there's some extra signs in there. But uh, but I think uh, yeah, I think the the dynamics plus the plus the simulations plus the agreement with mean field uh, for the you know where that's for the chiral system, uh, taking together those uh, indicate that we're, we're working with the chiral system. Thanks. All right. Well, if there are no more questions in the chat here. Um, let's thank Tyler again. And uh, that's it. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks again for accommodating the uh, time zones. <laughs>